Hey there, everybody, and welcome. Josh Cantwell here, CEO at Strategic Real Estate Coach and Freeland Ventures, and welcome to another edition of Strategic Real Estate Coach Radio. And I am in particularly very excited today to be talking with uh, a, a, a woman that I'm really excited to get to know, but I already consider a, a mentor to me in the real estate business, entrepreneurship, and growing and scaling companies. I have with me today none other than Barbara Corcoran. Barbara, how are you today? Thanks so much for joining us. I'm doing well. Beautiful day. I'm going to have to say after the summer, I'm in that Monday blues kind of frame of mind this week. I really don't want to come back. <laughs> I got <gotcha. laughs> you. Fantastic. So if anybody has uh, been ignoring television, ignoring Shark Tank, ignoring all the different places and mediums and platforms that Barbara has been uh, you know, out there and talking and speaking and teaching... Uh, and you don't know her, let me give you five seconds of introduction. Barbara considers herself a D student, somebody who kind of just got through high school, got through college, got through her early 20s, but ultimately fell in love with real estate and took a $1,000 loan and built that into a real estate empire in New York City, ultimately doing over $5 billion of real estate transactions and ultimately selling that real estate company for a multiple, multiple figure of over $60 million. And now, of course, she's one of the famous and fabulous hosts of Shark Tank. And we're excited to be with her today to specifically talk about peak performance, to talk about you growing your company and building your business. And we're hoping to extract some tips and tools out of you, Barbara, today for helping us grow our businesses. And so I want to jump in with exactly that. But first, I want to ask you, Barbara, what are you up to today? What's the most fun and exciting thing that you're working on right now? Well, if you want to know what the most fun and also the most scariest thing, it has nothing to do with real estate or Shark Tank. I was uh, asked to be on Dancing with the Stars. I've never watched it. I'm going to watch it this weekend. Uh, but I saw it like, whoa, dancing. I can't dance, but I always thought I could be a good dancer if I tried hard. And so I think of it as 12 weeks of free dancing lessons, and I've got a drop-dead, gorgeous dance partner named Keel, like the man dream I've always wanted, and he's dancing with me for four hours a day. Like, I'm pretty happy. I'm worn out at first. He's young enough to be my grandchild, but I'm very happy. I, I don't bet. get it that often. And I understand <laughs> right, before you, right before you joined us today, you were in the dance studio for the last three or four hours. Is that right? Four hours, four hours a day, and going back. Yeah. So he's pretty dreamy, huh? <laughs> oh my God! Well, it depends who you're dancing with. Ask any hot-blooded woman. Oh, that is fantastic. So, Dancing with the Stars. So when you're with us at our event coming up, um, you hopefully will be one of the final candidates on the show and still be dancing. And then you're going to take some time away to come join us, right? Yes, of course. But I'm not going to be talking about dancing. Sure, nobody gives a crap about the dancing question. Uh, we're going to be talking real estate. I know you very much want me to address uh, creating uh, a great culture, uh, leadership qualities, how you organize yourself, how you manage your life work, plus the rest of your life, so you have a meaningful life, uh, how to really build a team that will support you uh, as you get old and gray, uh, investing in real estate, you name it. I'm a real estate gal, so I'm happy to talk about whatever you want. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. So how about business, Barbara? What Maybe in real estate or outside of real estate, what's the most exciting business that you're involved in right now and what makes it exciting for you? Well, I sold my real estate company and if I didn't, I would obviously say that that's the most exciting. Uh, but I have invested in over 32 businesses as a result of being a shark investor on Shark Tank. And I would say uh, it's a run up. Uh, with a number of my businesses, probably, uh, I would say two, three, four of them at the very top, I love working with. And when I ask myself, what is it that I really love working uh, with these businesses? They have nothing to do with each other, totally different uh, services, products. It's, I love the entrepreneurs that lead them. Give me a great entrepreneur that has the essential qualities of what makes someone really successful. And it's like flying. It's not even working. It's just like we all love our work. I remember the first day I sat my little high heels on the concrete of Manhattan and showed my first rental apartment. I was in love with the business. It was like, this is work. I should be paying somebody to do this. Well, certainly with all of my investments, it's been that way. Give me a great entrepreneur and it's an absolute delight. Top of mind on my uh, my most favorite, well, don't tell, it's like playing favorites with children, all these sure. nice 
too. But my most favorite certainly would be Cousins Maine Lobster out of California. Two kids that just started a business on the side. They had two full-time jobs. One was a real estate agent. One was a uh, pharmaceutical salesman right out of college. And they just opened a lobster truck on the side in L.A. They weren't even from there. They're from Maine. And uh, I met them on Shark Tank with one truck. And now they have um, over 100 franchisees that open in Europe. Just watching their progress. But what I love about them is a perfect entrepreneurs. They opposite each other. One's an expander, keeps thinking there's another mountain to climb before he gets finished with the last one, he's already up the next one. The other one, a total container, trying to rein it in and keep it in control. And I have found out, actually, now it's, I'm just thinking of the first time, every one of my most favorite businesses are owned by partners with opposite skill sets and the needed skill sets that you have to have if you really want to build an empire. That is fantastic. I, I, uh, I'm blessed to be surrounded by... Uh, a business partner who's um, similar to me, but has a different still skill set and an executive management team. And I've used some different uh, tools, some different personality profiles, instinct profiles to kind of identify those guys. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm going to talk about that a little bit at our event that you're going to be at. If I, um, could I just, if I, if I could interrupt you, uh, one of the things the cousins did before they started their partnership is take these personality tests and be very blunt with each other as to what was going to be an asset, what was going to be in the way, and address early. So I, I am such a believer in those two. I wish every one of my investors, my investments, would actually take the, those kinds of tools and make use of them, but they have not. But those guys are very smart to do that early, I feel. Fantastic, Barbara. Do you have a favorite type of test, like the Colby profile or the DISC profile? Is you know, honest to God, I don't because I've never been smart enough to use them. I didn't even know they existed back whenever. I remember taking uh, some kind of a, making all my, making sure all my new applicants wanted to work for me in sales with no experience to the sales test. Uh, but I threw it away right away because one of my best friends took it and she failed it miserably. And I said, do not go into real estate. And she's one of the top realtors in the world. Westchester County. So I got rid of that test, but I'm not sure. I'm sure you're the expert on that one, but I do believe in them if they're accurate. I mean, they save a lot of time and they force an honest conversation early up. That's why I like them. Absolutely. Me too. Fantastic. Um, my favorite is the Colby profile. If anybody wants to check that out, Colby.com. I'm actually going to make a note of that. Yeah. And what's cool about it, Barbara, is it measures somebody's instincts. It doesn't measure how smart they are or what their IQ is. It also doesn't really measure their personality, whether they're an introvert or an extrovert. It actually measures their instincts. And I'm what's known as a high green. I'm uh, somebody that's a quick start. So I'm a classic entrepreneur. I like to find new things and start new things. And I always have new ideas. And so I have to build inside of my business, I have to build what's known as a high red, a fact finder, or a high blue who's a follow through. And those are the guys in my operations departments that take all my wild harebrained ideas and they see them through. They do the research on them to see if they're going to be viable. And then if they are viable, we implement and execute. It's my high blue follow through. His name is Jason Schlegel and we have a couple of others. They really see that uh, that idea come to fruition. So that's what we use, Colby.com. Yeah. You know, I have to say that um, over all the years in business, building my own real estate brokerage firm, working with these entrepreneurs that I do daily now, uh, with my new media company that I work with daily, run every day. I have to say that I don't hire anybody without following through and a high whatever you said that rating was that you used in the Colby. I just don't bother to hire anyone who's not extremely organized because even if they're a big idea man, I could be the big idea man and not be organized, but I have to be organized and, and I need to throw it at whoever's going to organize and follow through for me. But I don't want anybody in my organization who can't follow through. I think it's uh, just terrible, a drain on the team. I'm, I'm not very nice about it. The minute I spot it, I get rid of that person. Like, thank you for working with us for two days, but you're out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gotta be organized. It drags the rest of the team down. Take no prisoners. You know. I value the organization enormously, you know, as long as you have somebody with big ideas. Fantastic. So, Barbara, let's talk about that. What do you think are some of the key traits, the three or four or five? sort of characteristics that you see in these elite entrepreneurs that could be in real estate or some other category, some other niche. But what are those three or four things that you see repeatedly when you see a successful business, you see a successful CEO or a founder or a partnership? What are some of those characteristics that you're recognizing? Well, number one, I would say street smarts. And that doesn't mean high IQ as you alluded to a moment ago. It means the kind of street smarts that has fast, quick judgment on your feet in any opportunity, whether it be trouble or whether it be a quiet opportunity that the others can't see, 
or whether if he come off a bad turn of failing miserably and, and having the smarts to hang out a minute longer and see if there's some angle he can work uh, to make something good of it. Uh, but it's a certain kind of a street smart. I can give you many, many examples. I've become acutely aware of it. I was never aware of it in myself, interestingly, because when you're street smart, it's so intuitive and so much part of your personality, you tend not to know how good you are at it. Okay, You need somebody else to observe it. Now, I'm in an interesting position of having invested in many businesses, and I see the street smarts constantly and sadly for me after my money goes into a business. I also see it very quickly as a lack of street smarts, and you know what I do? I write off the investment immediately. If someone doesn't have street smarts, it's over in my head. I might look like I'm interested in their investment. I'm really not. In fact, in my office, I have every one of my businesses I invest in in a beautiful matted frame. That's A1, like the honeymoon. The minute I spot that lack of uh, judgment on the spot, I flip over the frame and they're upside down in my office forever more. Why? Just to remind me not to spend a lot of time with them. It's because I, after a while, I get confused. Who was that? What business was that? And there's so much coming at me. Uh, so I would say street smart. Let me give you a, a tiny example that just popped into my head. One of the very important things on Shark Tank is to not only air on our Shark Tank for an entrepreneur. That's number one. You get the cash on the shark. That's number two. But what keeps that company front and forward in the viewer's mind is I can sell my production team on doing an update. How well they're doing. How well they're doing. And you have to create a storyboard. And I'm very good at storyboard. So I sold... Uh, I sold my producer to L.A. that we are going to get an award from the governor of Maine of creating the most jobs in the state of Maine. My cousin's been lobster. The Maine of cousin's been lobster day. Do you want to send the camera crew? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll send. We'd love that update. And then I called, of course, the governor of Maine's PR people and said, hey, L.A. wants to send the camera crew, but we need an award for the best blah, blah, blah. I, I basically sold both sides. But something went wrong. When we got there, I wanted their brand all over the TV. And I'm sorry it takes so long. I'll try, to, I'll try to come to the end of this quick story, which is getting a little too long now. <laughs> but I think uh, chef hats on their 50 workers that were in the factory packing lobster rolls, packing happy, smiling, so good and everything. Cousins made lobster. Cousins made a great red so that no one at home could miss their bread and they order from them. But what happened was my producer walked in and said, the chef hats are too much, they almost come off. But what did my great entrepreneur say? He say, he said, I'm sorry, sir, but it's a company policy. I never let them take off their hats. That's street smarts. So on TV, everybody at home didn't see 50 heads, but they saw 50 chef hats. Cousins, 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 cousins in every single angle they shot. That's street smarts. I loved him for that. I knew I had a winner on my hand. That response, beautifully executed put the problem to bed and took advantage of the marketing opportunity all with just one thought like that. Okay. That's street smarts. The other thing that I would have to say, and I'm going to tell you, uh, I can tell you many stories, sadly, of, re- of the lack of resiliency, being able to be hit on the head and being too stupid to get to even lay low. You know, most people that smash on their head, if they're half intelligent, they're going to say, better keep a low profile. No, my best entrepreneurs get smashed on their head and they don't have enough smarts to say, well, they pop up almost like, hit me again. Now, you might think that's a bad thing, but I have found I've left quality in any of my entrepreneurs. Bingo, I got a winner. I recognize it right away. I can tell you that the minute I'm on the phone with any of my entrepreneurs and they even spend a second feeling sorry for themselves, like, well, we, we had 50,000 units coming in from Shark Tank night, but my supplier made a mistake. I knew he was going to make a mistake. I don't know why he did that to me. Any of the he did to me kind of conversation, I go over to the wall, I flip the picture upside down. They will never make it in business. Never make it. I find that all my great winners take no time feeling sorry for themselves. I, I shouldn't say no time, but a second. Like if I get hit or embarrassed or put back and my best dreams get diminished, oh my God, of course it hits you. You're a human being, but it's how long you take to get right back up. So that that ability to, to bounce up whatever that resiliency, I guess is the right word for it. That is, that is uh, number two on my list. And then I would have to say, and it's so underestimated today, the competitive gene in a human being. Okay. I'm competitive by nature because I'm more than 10 kids and we have to compete just to get my mother's attention. All the kids in my family are competitive. Okay. But if I find that I have a nice entrepreneur, which I love, that's cool, but they sure as well better be competitive too. Because if they're not competitive by nature, Ugh. they just don't really bite and grab and want to get to the head of the it's, And that's an instinctive thing or a groom thing, but you can't fake it. You're either competitive or you're not. And if you're not competitive, you never get to the top of anything. 
So I'm always looking for that competitive gene. So there are three, and I can keep going on, but in the interest of time, should I chop it right there? You're in charge. Fantastic, Barbara. That was great. I love the resourcefulness because as a CEO or a founder, I find that no, nobody's going to feel sorry for you. It's your business to make or lose. And feeling sorry for yourself or saying this isn't working, it's somebody else's fault, you're 100% responsible for the success of that company. <laughs> And being resourceful, finding the next system, the next tool, the next vendor, the next whatever it is, that's your job mm-hmm. to just, you know, get it on the head. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. and that's the joy of owning your own business. I mean, why would you want to work for somebody else when you can't dictate the changes? For me, that would be the equivalent of being sent to prison. If someone said to me, guess what? We're going to give you the best job in the world and you're going to be one of the best employees. I would, I would say, shoot me now. Shoot me now. If I can't be in charge, why would I want to even spend my time on anything? Okay, Because all the good entrepreneurs like to be the lead dog. Okay, And some of them are actually not even as smart as half the people that work for them, but they really want to be the lead dog, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes when I went through bad real estate cycles and was leveraged to the kazoo, didn't know how I pay my debts, thought, oh, this is it. I'm probably going down. On those many moments of the real estate ups and downs of New York, which was always almost over leveraged, I used to actually lay in bed and I go, what the hell will I do if I really have to call this company? And the same thing came to my head every time. And it made me so happy. I went to see that, I'll get an apple car. I'll sell apples on the corner. Why? Because I hustle more apples than anybody. It's just a little car. Surely I could borrow the money to get a car and I could buy the apples. Uh, but it was never like, I'll get a job. I could get a great real estate executive job. Never did I think of that. It's about being in business for yourself. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. I have a, a wild story. I'll tell you about it some other time when we have, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll mention it now. You talk about taking maybe a few seconds. And I'll remind you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please. Um, you know, it's part of the fabric of who I am. I'm actually a pancreatic cancer survivor. And pancreatic mm-hmm. cancer is just an 8% survival rate. So I was eight, 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 just eight, eight single, eight. single eight. digits. And so I was diagnosed in 2011. I remember one night, the day I was diagnosed, uh, I allowed myself to get up to my master bedroom, get home and cry. And I remember the next day putting that behind me and saying, okay, I have this new challenge, uh, but we're going to figure it out. I'm going to work with the doctors, work with my wife, work with my kids. I got to figure out how this, how does this going to all work inside my business? What do I need to do with my employees? It literally, I snapped out of it like that. And it's it's a wild and pretty extreme example. And thank God, you know, my, you know, the eight, 8% survival rate after five years, I just celebrated my five year anniversary about uh, eight months ago. So I'm one of the lucky 8%. But I think the lesson there is like you said, Barbara, I, 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 devastating diagnosis. I gave myself one night to kind of sulk in it. And then I was like, okay, you know, tomorrow's a new day. Let's start over. And that's a wild experience. Some people in business or whether they're a mother, whether they're a father, whether they're a salesperson, this this negativity sort of dominates their life. They don't just move on and decide that taking action and making decisions, can their day could change tomorrow if they just do something new. Um, mm-hmm. So pretty wild example. But I, I wanted to ask. Yeah, you- not just a wild example, an extreme example. I, um, I can't even imagine being in that position and I, I would – I would be afraid to see what I would be made of, honestly, in something like that, okay? Um, but what is interesting to me about how you explained it is the next day, what did you do? You welcome right into your chest all the responsibilities, your family, your employees, what you're going to do with this. You took the responsibility totally. Uh, most people would not, I, I would suggest, at all. It's kind of like, oh, my God, what am I? You didn't relinquish your control, that, or, nor did you relinquish your power, okay? And... Uh, that is, I'm sure, hugely responsible for getting you through. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I knew if it was, if, if was going to happen, it was up to God. It was up to me. It was up to just, like, we got to make something happen here. I wasn't going to sulk in it and wait. And I think in business, there's too many people, especially in real estate, that maybe get started. They have some private capital. They have some money. They go try to go find deals. And one deal goes bad. Or they make offers on properties. And the offers don't get accepted. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, I quit. I'm out. And it's like, no, man, it's, you're going to get knocked around a little bit. You're going to experience challenges. That's part of the fun of it. If you don't, if you don't like rejection, why would you be in the real estate business? It's 99% rejection. Yeah. You can't equip yourself to expect rejection. Um, I don't know why you're in the business, honestly. That's right. That's right. 
So Barbara, if you were going back and talking to your 20 something year old self about the real estate business that you started, knowing all the things that you know now about entrepreneurship, growing and scaling companies, investing in businesses, what is some advice that you would give your younger self when you were just getting going as a real estate entrepreneur? Like, what would I be, what would I have done a little differently sure. now that I'm older and wiser? Is that the kind of gist of it? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I ne- I've been asked those questions before. I never have a good answer because I don't second guess myself. You know, I figure I, in any situation, I'm moving fast and doing the best I can. I'm putting my heart and soul into whatever I'm doing. And so I always feel like I did the best I could. So I don't return to it. I wonder what I did better. There's only one time that I welch on doing what my gut told me to do, and I regret that I didn't do, but eventually I got to. It just took me a year to get there. So maybe I wasted a whole year of my life. And that was when my boyfriend and business partner uh, told me on the seventh year of business he was marrying my secretary. And that was such a shot in the heart and the gut for me uh, that I think I wasn't as, I don't think I, I don't, I don't even know it. I don't even know why I was so weak, but I was weak enough to accept it for a year and continue the partnership, even when he returned to my seat in what we used to share as an office. So I was moved to the sales pit, and she's sitting in my seat. That was so angering for me. I I could feel the fury every day when I I walked in. I think I didn't have a legal gun, honestly, at the time. I don't know who I'd shoot first, but I'd have, I would have been in jail for murder, no doubt. But I accepted that for a year, second guessing myself uh, for a lot of good reasons. I'm like, well, I can't do it without him. He found me in the diner, he gave me the thousand dollars. I'd be nowhere without him, forgetting that I had something to do with the success to that point. Um, I also had the excuse of my employees. I had uh, 14 salespeople, commissioned salespeople. Let's not upset the family. Let's stay with the bad marriage, not to upset the kids. You know, uh, that that was part of it. I think more than anything else, I didn't have the balls for me. I was, I'm a girl, so I didn't have them anyway. But you know what I mean. I didn't have the courage to get in there and get the heck out of it. And But the day I did, uh, it happened so quickly that we ended that business, just like a football jar chop. You pick first, I'll pick the second, we chop the set 14 people in half, we chop the credit, uh, what we had, a little bit of cash we had. Boom, I was out of there that Friday afternoon. Whoa, that was easy. What did I wait a year for that for? And thank God, because that was the beginning of the Brooklyn group. That was the beginning of my real fortune. I thought he was the golden goose and I was the egg that he laid. That was really the way I looked at it. Okay? But I found out that I'm the golden goose and the Portland group was the egg I laid. Even when I sold the Portland group for $66 million, after a year, I'm like, oh my God, I gave away my golden goose. I sold my golden goose. It took me another year after that to get smart enough to realize, no, 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 I left the egg. I'm the golden goose. I'll lay another one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> A media business, you know. So, but if I, if I, that's the only regret I have. That the minute he said, "I'm marrying your secretary," I'm so sorry. I should said, "No problem, see ya." That's what I should have said. But I didn't have the confidence. I had a year of second guessing, and so not second guessing my gut. I guess uh, would have been the only improvement. But I, to my own good credit, if I could, if I could uh, make up for that in my own mind's eye is I always had a great gut reaction. I knew when the market was going to fall. I knew when it was going to go up. I knew when I should cut staff. I just instinctively felt it in my bones, like breathing. And I always moved on. And everybody said, what? It makes no sense. Of course, it didn't make logical sense. But I stayed true to what I felt in my gut. I mean, my business. And I never made the wrong calls, ever, ever, because I, I was so true to myself. I said for that one year of my life, yeah, when I got kind of off course. Yeah, that's all right. Sometimes that happens. But listen, I think the lesson there, right, is if you're the entrepreneur, you got to bet on yourself. Even if you're not the entrepreneur and you're going to be the entrepreneur, nobody's going to believe. The world believes in people that believe in themselves. It's so true. Bet on yourself. And then, you know, listen, take everything in. I got lots of smart people around me that are giving me advice and giving us suggestions and marketing campaigns and ways to raise money and ways to run our live events. But at the end of the day, you're the jockey. You got to make the call. Yeah. You got to make the call. And you know, and sometimes you can't even tell why you object to something. I have negated many big spends on certain things, or uh, I've opened offices in the worst of times. I've done contrary thinking on so much simply because all the logic would point to everybody, this whole team, this whole committee, I'm sure is right. They're a lot better educated. They're really smart. They analyze it to death, but that's what you all want to think. 
It was so much educated to use our brain in business building. You took, you talked to any savvy entrepreneur who started with nothing. I'm telling you, they don't have that big a brain, but what they have is great gut instinct, really. And I should have added that to my list earlier. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, you know, you, you can never build a big business. The businesses that you've built and sold, the businesses that I've built, the businesses you're investing in without an amazing team. You can't do it all by yourself. We all know that. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, having a team is fun. And I've read a lot about your bio, how you treated your real estate business like a family, like a big family. You're one of 10 siblings, so you built your business in the same fashion. But what tips and ideas do you have or, or tactics for selecting the right team and how do you treat your team and building an amazing culture? I think the basic ingredient is you must love. I know that doesn't sound like a um, cool thing today, but you must love and appreciate your people. And on the other side of that equation, get rid of your clunkers as fast as you can. In the clunker category, I would say complainers come to my mind, number one. I see them as thieves in the night that steal the energy of the entrepreneur running it and also of the colleagues that they work with. Get one complainer in a group of eight people, and sooner or later, your eight people will know what's wrong with everything. So I was merciless in asking anyone. I mean, I'm not talking about people who honestly critique. That's, you have to have criticism too. Those are your best friends in a way. People can actually criticize what's going on and tell you the truth. That, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who are never loved and they're sad about life and they're gonna make sure everybody else is sad with them. those people. I, I never had them in my company. And it's like pulling a horn out of a horse's hoof. Every time I asked somebody who was that in that whole category of people, you could feel the relief in the nature body of the you could feel shoulders come down. Even people who didn't even know they were being bothered by the company is how you cleaned the air. Sometimes you gave your, your company a scrub, so to speak, you know. Um, so I would say getting rid of the losers. Uh, clunkers who don't have the talent, but they're such nice. I shouldn't say clunker sounds as me. I call myself a clunker in many ways, but I should change that word. Um, people who don't have the talent for the job, but they're lovely, and you just don't have the heart to fire them. Not me. Uh-uh. You're so cruel to let them go down a path that they're never going to succeed in. All right? So I always address it front and center with people and say, listen, I, you know I adore you. Um, you know that uh, I know that you're making every effort. I don't think I've ever seen anyone work harder trying to do something, but what a waste of you. This is not your talent. Let me tell you what I've noticed are your talents while I've been working with you. And let me also give you some suggestions on where you can apply and be a happier person. Um, my pet, my uh, business partner, Esther Kaplan, used to say when people were fired by me and left my office, they looked like they had gotten promoted. Well, it was true. They had gotten promoted. They got promoted out of misery. You know, they're trying to do something they're never going to be good at. Who likes a job they're not good at? Nobody. Okay, they might accept it eventually, but they don't love it. Okay. All right. And on the positive side, on the loving, I would say the key ingredient in loving is demonstrated love. And in a business, I don't care if you have 10 people or if you have 1,000 people, you can individually show love through appreciation one-on-one. -on -one. But when a business gets really big, you have to institutionalize a system for showing love and appreciation. And my best is not raises, which people readily, I mean, I, I believe people have to have raises all the time. But the most powerful thing in the world is recognition. If you can institutionalize a system to make sure that little deeds are constantly recognized in your organization, you will have people loving you even when you can't remember their names. And I loved it when I had 50 people. I knew everybody's name, the husband's name, how old the kids were. By the time I had 100, I kind of knew some of the spouses. By the time it was 500, I was lucky if the person didn't look promoted to me. <laughs> but I knew I had a system in play that when they did that heroic act, made an attempt and failed, or made an attempt in one, there was some recognition that was going to catch it through the management system and make them a hero publicly. And so I think thinking through your organizational systems to make sure that you get constant recognition is essential if you're out to build a big business. If you're not out to build a big business and you want a small, tight little family, you personally as a chief in charge, the mother or the father, constantly saying, you're amazing. And let me tell you why. Oh, you're amazing. And let me tell you why. <laughs> and you're constantly coming up with that because that's really what people want. They want to be loved, even in the workplace. I mean, love sounds like a funny word. They want to be appreciated, appreciated in the workplace. I can't tell you how powerful it was, uh, a technique I built 
who are recruiting people out of my competitive firms. That kind of got me the beginning of every great salesman I spoke for my competitors. And it went like this. If I read something in our real estate trade or if somebody helped one of my agents make a big deal, I would send them flowers with the same poisonous note intentionally written this way right into their office. And my note would say, um, congratulations on blah, blah, blah. Okay. I'm sure your boss is so proud of you. Exclamation, love, Barbara Corcoran. You know, what do you think they did? He didn't even tell me congratulations. Never mind, so proud of me. And this babe sending me flowers? Yeah. <laughs> that was my hello. How do you do to get into everybody's top salespeople psyches, you know? And I would just keep reeling them in, paying attention, not to my own, but to them. And it was so powerful, even giving recognition to the other guy's property. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that a recognition I'm just a believer, and that was my main power tool. Okay, and then if there was one other, uh, let me not forget, and I might make it put in reverse order and say number one is having fun. The more you can have fun at the workplace, the more people will want to stay. Why do they work with all my art drivers in the business when they got a similar commission split, the same beautiful offices, and they come to my place? I got massages on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Friday and Mondays. That shoe shine people. Every February, we had a sweetheart party where everybody got to dress in a certain theme. In the summer, we rode in elephants. We had so much fun that I meticulously planned. And let me tell you, everybody in the industry wanted to know, what did you do at your party last night? Okay. So why would you work for the next time we can get the same old baloney that everybody gives and come to my house and join a big, happy, ridiculous family? And so I think having fun is uh, the most underestimated power card in the toolbox today. They go into business. You've got to let your people laugh. And if you're not even a funny guy, like you seem like you'd be a lively, funny guy. Let's say you're not a funny guy, okay? You've got some drunk in your organization you can put in charge of. Sure. <laughs> Just make him a cheap drunk officer or something. Okay. So there's no excuse not to create a culture of fun, whether or not you are fun as an individual, because people really don't have enough fun. They don't have enough fun in life. It's all responsibility, not enough. Yeah, and you know what? People spend more time in the business and the workplace than they do with their own spouses and kids. So they might have fun. That's where they're going to spend the majority of their adult life while they're working. So you got to create an awesome environment. I love it. Uh, Barbara, I wanted to ask you about um, you know, I, I teach a lot of our people to raise private capital for their real estate business so that they don't have to rely on bank loans. They don't have to rely on hard money loans. They don't have to rely on institutional investments. They can fund their purchases with private capital from, you know, whether it's self-directed IRAs or from cash and other people that. Or even credit cards. Or even credit cards. I see that a lot. Yeah. So what are your thoughts? Obviously, this is related very much to Shark Tank and you buying into businesses. When you're making an investment into a company or a business idea or a real estate deal, whatever it is, what are some keys that you look for that you're when you're going to make an investment or what are some things that you would tell my audience to say, look, if you're asking for money, you're asking for an investment in a deal or a business, what are some of the things that you must have in order to get an investment? Uh, when you're saying you must have, from my perspective, as, as an investor, or if I'm asking that, if I'm going out to raise capital, which would yeah, first? I guess the perspective I'd like to hear from is let's, let's assume you are an investor, you are the business owner, yeah. and you're looking for capital, and you're at pitching an investor like a shark. Um, what are some things that you have to have, ducks that you have to have in a row, whether it's metrics or whether it's your business model, your systems? What are some things that are like the, the perfect? parts of a of an investor pitch to well, get money. Well first of all you have to realize just like any shopper looking for a new suit at Macy's, every shopper is different. Right. And so if I were to uh, paint the picture of the profile that I now know my fellow five sharks shop for, it's vastly different shark to shark. Okay. Um, if you were if you were uh, pitching Mr. Wonderful, for example, Kevin the Ed guy that sits in the middle, who by the way is the sweetest guy in the whole thing in real life. He's a pushover. But he plays that role very well. Uh, he's all about metrics. All about metrics. Nickels and dimes, he wants to get back on every sale. Nickels and dimes, that's how he sees you as a good potential. Um, I have found, for me, I couldn't care less about metrics. I couldn't care less about anything that you, any that you have to ask a uh, first-year-old, first-grader to define who wouldn't have the answer. If it's real simple, uh, that's what I'm interested in. So all that fancy talk and analysis uh, I find doesn't mean crap. In fact, the businesses that I'm investing with best metrics have gone the worst. 
The business I'm investing with most educated entrepreneurs, including some of the most fantasy business schools in America, have gotten worse. And I often ask myself, why is that? Because they have their eyes on the wrong goal. Uh, they're, they're thinking about return, blah, 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 you know, how we can spend it, you know, all that fancy stuff. But it doesn't amount to anything because it's only theory on a new business. What I'm looking for always is an entrepreneur that's smart. I've taken even investments in, in smart entrepreneurs and even totally changed the business. Then my business model, but to, you're in the wrong business. Hey, Jim, think of, boom, okay, they're the right entrepreneur, wrong business idea. Okay. It's always about the entrepreneur. When you're coming to raise capital, the one common ground I think all the sharks are looking for, which is rarely asked, interestingly, I was actually thinking about that the other day, but always on our mind is how am I going to get my money out? How am I going to get my money out? Really address. Usually the big answer to that is when this is an empire and we sell, your stock that you paid $100,000 for is now going to probably worth $20 million. Oh, really? Sure. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Um, but if you can say to an investor, let me tell you exactly how I plan to get your money back out and when and what the growth potential there is. Talk to me about my selfish interests. That's really what an investor wants to know. How do I make the money money, you know? And so I think that's really a, a almost constant overlooked on the pictures on Shark Tank. And we have to pull out inch by inch. And when I watch people present to large crowds of investors in real life versus a TV life, are uh, rarely, really clearly stated. And yet, when you can clearly state that and really have uh, rock solid reasons why you believe it will come true, I think you win the respect of the investor right away. But can I just get away from that for a second? Because I didn't want to forget to mention I think that 99% of the people that go for a real estate investor have no business doing it. I think you're better off hopping your uh, your credit card and holding loan. I think you're better off borrowing from uh, families and friends. And I know that's not a fashionable thing, but families and friends uh, on all the successful businesses in America are like three quarters of all funding. Okay, but people have an idea, they have little sales, and they're going to share their stock. What a mistake! I'll give you a perfect example. When I was living in the Portland Group, I had a terrible real estate year when interest rates were 18%. I probably had at the time 150 sales people. I was probably ranking eighth or ninth in my industry at that point. And Merrill Lynch, the venerable Merrill Lynch came in and wanted to buy my company. They believed in my potential. They were going to do this and that and that. I organized a deal to sell 95% of my company for $100,000. Do you know that was only five years before I sold it for $66 million? Wow. And I sold it. I just that I had time. I gutted it out. I gutted it out. I turned away the deal the last second based on gut instinct or fear or what a potluck. Who knows? But my God, to give away your stock if you really believe in your business and to be so quick to give it away makes me not believe in your business. That's the way I go. Got it. Yeah, fantastic. I, I find for sure the, the friends and family offering, if you can't get a friend or a family to invest in what you're doing, how are you going to get a shark or an institution or a stranger? Or your American Express card, or your Visa card, or a second mortgage on your house. That's meaningful money to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. One more question. Only because I got to go dancing again. I know. Right. If you see who I'm dancing with, you would understand my need to go. Yeah, absolutely. So, Barbara, I know we need to wrap up. And I, I wanted to get your quick take on the real estate market today. I know you're a contributor on the Today Show on NBC. What are your thoughts on today's real estate market? What's going on in 2017? And what are investors and agents seeing out there? I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to research that before I see you at the presentation. Yeah. I never even read real estate news unless I have to speak to it. So I'll update myself and let you know. I'm I'm very current in New York City because I live here and I have a whole circle of ex-employees, friends, managers around me constantly, you know. And so I can tell you in New York City, the top end of our market is not doing well. Top top end of the market in excess of I would say seven million dollars. Uh, why that is is there's a lot of international investors that are, are shaky about our presidency. Uh, there's a lot of overbuilding of the super duper luxury apartments that have built for the international trade here. But if you lap that top, top tier off, you know, $7 million to $150 million personal purchases, which is remarkable always to everybody. 
Um, I would say that the top end of the luxury market is clicking along rock solid. We don't have enough listings. And the lower you go down the food chain, the fewer the listings we have. And the harder it is to get your hands on a piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the numbers in New York City are mind boggling. And just as everybody breathes in and says, I can't go any higher, it jumps up another 15%. When you're a bubble here, I don't see it. Maybe I don't have a good gut instinct. I always knew the bubbles all the time. But I don't feel a bubble from everything I'm, I'm feeling around me. Um, so luckily, I hope I'm not wrong. But I'll, I'll have a national opinion when I see you. All right. Ten, a little knowledge to take it, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you dropping some knowledge with us today for sure. Um, so guys, listen, everybody who's going to end up listening to this recording, watching this video, uh, let us know how we did. Leave us a rating. Leave us a review. Uh, leave, leave us a question that we can ask Barbara at the Flippin' Fun Summit. Remember, um, the Flippin' Fun Summit's coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, and we do have a special interview offer that you can go check it out if you're curious and want to attend at flippinfun.com slash Barbara. Uh, get a special uh, over 80% off our general admission ticket. And, uh, of course, have an opportunity to, to upgrade to a VIP ticket and meet Barbara herself yeah. back in our group. Oh, what a VIP. <laughs> VIP, that's right. So, Barbara, listen, I just really appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing so much great entrepreneurial knowledge with us today. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Okay, my pleasure. Very nice hanging with you. Absolutely. You too. Good luck on Dancing with the Stars. My wife is going to love it. All right, guys, listen, that's been another episode of the uh, Strategic Real Estate Coach Radio. Thanks so much for being here. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.